You know, I want to show you a quick video clip that will really prepare your heart for the message. If you would, direct your attention to the screen and make sure you catch the beginning of this. It is so true. Watch this. Take your Bibles this morning, and I want you to go to Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter number 9. And we've been in this chapter, but this morning I want to cover a different aspect that we have not looked at. You remember this chapter contains uh, Jesus Christ reaching one person after another. And as we get to the end here, we're going to look at verses 35 and 36, and I want you to look at the context of the passage. If you don't have a Bible, grab the Pew Bible there in front of you. It's page, uh, let's see, page number 1001. We always put it on the top of the message handout because I want you to look into the Bible. Check me out. Make sure that what I'm saying corresponds with God's Word. And around here at Crossroads, we really want you to look into God's Word. So feel free to use that and go to Matthew 9. And let's get the context. Let's go to verse 35. It says, in Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Jesus is disturbed here, the Bible says, because he sees multitudes of people that need somebody to care for them, somebody to show them the way to true life. He said they have no shepherd. In other words, they got nobody to care for them. They got no one that cares for their soul. They are like dying scattered sheep. How many of you believe there are people in Daytona that have nobody to care for them? You believe that? Think there's folks like that in our, yeah, absolutely. They don't know anyone. They don't have anyone. You know, they, they, maybe they got family, but they live out of town. They got nobody to care for their soul. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I'm real burdened about this because he says, look at this. They're like dying, scattered sheep. Then look at verse 37 and notice what he says next. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous. Let's stop right there. He's saying, in other words, there are plenty of people that need the Lord Plenty of people out there that need to know about Jesus Christ and what he's done for them. He says, the harvest is plenteous. He said, there's plenty of people out there that that need to know about me. They need to know the way to life. They need to know there's peace. They need to know there's hope. There's plenty of people out there that are hurting, that they need to know the truth of God. He said, the harvest is plenteous. But look at verse 37. He says, the harvest truly is plenteous. But the laborers are few. He said, the laborers are few. He said, I don't have enough people to work among the hurting people. There's not enough help. So some of you that are business owners, it's Labor Day weekend, right? Some of you who have owned a business or you own a business can, you can kind of relate to Christ's dilemma here when he says, I don't have enough help. You know, and, and it's, I hear from business owners all the time, I would just love to find somebody who wants to work. Just someone who will show up every day and work, you know? 
He said they'll show up for a day or two and then they won't show up again. They just disappear. They just want to find someone who wants to work. And Jesus Christ was in the same dilemma. He's like, man, there's all kinds of people that need help. They need someone to reach them like Constance sung. They need somebody to reach out to them. Like she sung, I love that line where she said, they need someone to show them that, that God can turn their house into a home. And yet, he says, the laborers are few. I don't have enough help. And you know what reminded me when he said the laborers are few? Immediately, my mind went back two chapters. Go to Matthew's chapter 7. Go flip back two chapters and look at how this corresponds. Matthew 7. Look at verse 13. He says, now, now look at this. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Now look at verse 14. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and how many? Few there be that find it. So you know what that tells me when I compare the two passages? Few want anything to do with the Lord, but even fewer want to labor for Him in His harvest fields. But yet, the Bible clearly teaches, church, that there will be a special reward for those who labor out there in God's harvest fields that are trying to bring people to Jesus Christ. There is a special reward for those people. I met a guy this morning after the 815 service, and, uh, and, and he, uh, he and his wife came back to the hospitality room, and he was telling me how they've moved here, you know, from out of town. And, uh, and, and he said this, he said, um, he said, I got saved and came to know the Lord in California. And uh, he said, actually, the way it happened, he said, my boss is the one that led me to the Lord. He was the president of the company I worked for. And he said, I would always see him reading his Bible. And he said, I began to question that. I began to ask questions. He, and he began to share with me. And he said, then he invited me to an Easter service at his church. And he said, I trusted Jesus Christ to be my Savior. Each one, reach one. Just reach the people that are right there in front of you, you know? It's like we said last week, look out the window. There, there's people right there in, in our view. And, but Jesus said this. He said, few are going to enter that straight gate. Even fewer are going to want to labor in my harvest fields. But now, there's a reward for those who do. And in fact, look at the screen and I'll show it to you. 1 Corinthians 3, this is what Paul said using that harvest analogy. He said, I have planted an Apollos water. They're talking about getting the gospel, the good news to people. And he said, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. Again, you get this idea of laborers, right? Laboring for God. They're planting seeds. They're watering them. They're sharing Christ with people. Now look at this. He says, he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own what? Reward according to his own what? Labor. I'm not going to get any rewards for what you do, Tom, in reaching people. You're not going to get any rewards for what I do. He says, every man's going to receive rewards according to his own labor. But he assures us it's going to happen if you're laboring for God. He said, if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall. Just as sure as whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved is this promise. He says, if you are laboring for God, if you're going, if you're shining as a light, he says, I promise you, he says, he, look, what's the end of the verse say? He shall receive a what? Reward. Just as sure as can be, he said, you're going to get a reward in heaven if you are laboring for God in his harvest fields. Jesus proceeds. Go back to Matthew 9. I want to show you. Jesus proceeds to give the disciples the key in finding laborers. It may come as a bit of a shock and a surprise to you how Jesus said we're going to solve the problem of not having enough workers. What's the very first word? Let's all say the first word of verse 38. One, two, three. What is it? Pray. One more time. What's the first word? Pray. Pray. That word pray, look at it. He says, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth labors into his harvest. He said, there's a lot of hurting people out there. They need help. They need somebody to reach them like Constance sung somebody to reach out he said but I don't have enough laborers so guys pray 
And that word pray there means to beg. It means to petition. It means to make requests. Those of you that have kids, how many of you, whenever you would go to the checkout line at, at the grocery store, your kids would petition you for a candy bar or Skittles, huh? Beg, right? They petition you. They beg, I want a candy bar! And I believe that all these stores do that. They put it all right there on purpose to torture parents. What do y'all think, huh? They're torturing parents. And of course, my kids did the same thing. You know, they beg. <laughs> Even before they can talk, right? My little grandson, man, I said, man, there's so many. His little finger is used to point so many times during the day. <laughs> and what he's saying is, I want those Skittles. I want that candy bar. You know, and, and they, they beg you. And that's the idea of the word Pray. He says, I want you to pray. I want you to beg God. I want you to get serious about it. I, it's something you, the word pray there carries the idea of something that you really want. You really want God to do something. You say, I, mean, I got some problems in my life. And God says, you got to pray about it. Jesus believed in prayer. And I want to share with you some principles this morning that Jesus believed about prayer. And it's right here in this text. The first one is this. Look at it with me. Jesus believed that prayer is the ultimate solution to our problems. Can I get an amen out there, huh? He believed that prayer is the ultimate solution to our problems. Jesus establishes the problem in verses 36 and 37. We read it. What was the first part of the problem, church? Multitudes of hurting people that have nobody to care for their soul. Jesus said, that's the first part of the problem, is that we got multitudes of hurting people, nobody to care for them. Now, the second part of the problem was that people aren't exactly lining up at the door to serve the Lord by caring for people and reaching out to them. He said, the laborers are few. People will line up to get into Disney World. <laughs> people will line up to get ice cream. People will line up to go to the buffet, right? People will line up to go ride the ride at the county fair. But he says, people aren't lining up at the door to serve the Lord. He said, the labors are few. So Jesus said this. Look at verse number 38. He said, pray ye therefore. Say that with me. Pray ye therefore. I love the therefore. And you know, whenever you see a therefore in the Bible, you need to look and see what it's there for. I'm serious. You need to see what it's there for. And, and the reason why it's there, he didn't have to say that word, but he did. Every word of God is inspired and it's important. And he said, pray ye therefore. In other words, that therefore, he's, it's as if Jesus is saying, we got a problem, so it's really obvious, guys, what you need to do. You got to pray. You got to pray you there for. He said, there's a problem. You got to pray about it. Notice that Jesus didn't give them tips on how to recruit workers, and he didn't say, hey, guys, let's offer these incentives to people if they'll labor. Hey, let's offer to do a miracle for everybody who will labor for me. If they're bald-headed, I'll do a miracle and grow hair on their head. <laughs> I, that was not, brother, I did not have you in mind there. If, hey, <laughs> he goes, hey, man. <laughs> if, if, if a woman has gray hair, Jesus says, I'll, boom, and I'll blonde brunette, whatever she wants, you know. If, uh, if, if, you know, we'll offer people to do a miracle. If you got wrinkles and you'll come labor for me, whoo, all the wrinkles are gone. Right? No, he didn't do that. <laughs> It's fun to laugh, isn't it? Jesus said, no tricks, no gimmicks, no course in how to win friends and influence people. He says, guys, we got a serious issue. We got a lot of people out there that are hurting. We have to pray. We have to spend some time in prayer on this thing. When you think of Jesus with all of his mighty power to work miracles, to heal people, to cast demons out of people, even raise the dead, you might be prone to think, you may be prone to think with all that power, boy, he sure didn't need to pray. 
That's one man that didn't need to pray is Jesus because all that power he had. I submit to you that he had all that power to do those mighty things because he prayed so much. Jesus was constantly praying to the Father. Do you realize that? I just took five or six chapters out of the book of Luke just to show you how much prayer permeated Jesus' life. It's in your handout. Look at it with me. For time's sake, let's go to your handout. It says, Luke 5, 16, and he, Jesus, withdrew himself into the wilderness. Why did Jesus go out into the wilderness? It says he went into the wilderness and what? Prayed. Isn't that neat? He said, I got to get out of here. I got to get alone and pray. Look at the next one, Luke 6, 12. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray. And he continued all, how, how long? All night in prayer to God. The idea of the Bible is this was something that was a habit. This was something he did a lot. Look at Luke 9, 18. And it came to pass as he was alone praying. His disciples were with him and he asked them saying, whom say the people that I am? Luke 11, 1. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Do you understand, church, that Jesus Christ was encountering problems every day? Jesus Christ did not, he did not have this cushiony life of ease. Some of you may think that. You think, well, he was the son of God, you know, and, and so he kind of had a life. He didn't have a life of ease at all, at all. He had problem after problem after problem. Question, does anybody in here have any problems? Raise your hand if you got a problem. We're all in the same boat, right? I raised both hands, Brother Gary. Yeah, we all got problems. We all got problems. Jesus had problems. He had personal, listen, Jesus Christ was constantly dealing with people's personal problems. Not only that, he was dealing with people's spiritual problems, right? I mean, intense spiritual battles were going on that he had to deal with. Not only that, he had problems among his own disciples. They couldn't get along. They squabbled. Think that ever happens today? They, they're squabbling. He's got to figure out what to do with them because they're squabbling and fighting among themselves and getting jealous of each other. Then he had his own personal problems on top of all that. He had the scribes and the Pharisees constantly hounding him and always nipping at his heels like a, like a little dog. I mean, criticizing him, hounding him, just finding fault with him. Wanting to kill, people wanting to kill him. He had problems. And Jesus knew that the ultimate solution in dealing with these problems was prayer. He had to pray. And if he needed to pray, how much more do you and I need to pray? The second thing I want you to see is this. Number two, what we learn from this text, prayer must be in accordance with the Lord's will. Prayer needs to be in accordance with the Lord's will. Now, let's go back to the Bible, and I want you to look at it. Look at verse number 38. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest. So whose harvest is it? The Lord's that he will send forth laborers into, he didn't just say the harvest, he said, pray that God will send forth laborers into whose harvest? His harvest. So whose harvest is it, church? <clears throat> it's the Lord's. In other words, it is God's will that these hurting people be cared for in the world. It's God's will that somebody reaches out to them. It is his harvest. So when we pray for laborers, we can pray confidently knowing that we are praying right in the center of God's will. God's will is not spooky and mysterious like you hear it presented sometimes. God's will is not spooky. It's not mysterious. God's will is revealed in God's word. This book reveals his will. That's why we're such a Bible church here. And our motto is learning the Bible, living the Bible, is because God's will is revealed in this book. 
You see, at one time, God's will was a mystery. But Paul said in Ephesians 1, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. God's made it known. The Bible is a complete book. We have God's plan. We have God's will contained for us right here in black and white in the Bible. And this is where it becomes so important why you need to study the Bible. You study God's word so that you understand God's plan and where you fit in the plan of God in the Bible. And that, that the, the, the issues of rightly dividing the word of God, making sure that we know, okay, who is God talking to here? Who is this passage written to? Where are we at in, in the Bible? You know, the church, where are we at? You got to know those things. Why? Because it helps you to pray with greater intelligence and to pray with greater understanding when you pray. You know the will of God. Why? I'm reading it right here. I know God's will because it's right here. Sometimes we pray for things that are in clear violation of God's will, and then we can't expect those prayers to be answered. Uh, for example, I remember as a kid, I went to church a little bit with my parents. We went to a church. I never heard the gospel or anything there but they would teach us things from the Bible and I remember as a kid hearing that I needed to pray and that if I would pray in faith they you know use that verse if you prayed in faith it you know it's going to happen and so uh, I thought well okay prayed in faith it's going to happen I so I thought man I'm a kid you know I said I'm going to test this and so I go home and I kneel down beside my bed and I said Lord I pray and I'm believing you God I pray God that you will rain candy bars down in my front yard and man, I was sincere, buddy. Of course, I got up off my knees and I went and peeked. And there were candy bars all over the front yard. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm teasing. There wasn't one. I'm thinking, man, if God rained down manna from heaven for a whole nation, a few candy bars in the kid's front yard isn't a big deal, is it? But you know what? I wasn't praying with an understanding of God's will for today, was I? I was taking a text that had nothing to do with me and, and God was working and bringing manna from heaven. He certainly did do that for a specific time, for a specific people at that time. But you see, that's a silly illustration to show you how that we pray for things many times that are not in accordance with the Lord's will as revealed in his word. Look in your handout with me at a verse, 1 John 5. Notice what John says. It's on the back of your handout. It says, and this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything, what's the next phrase say? According to his will. Say that again. According to his will. He heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Now, when it says he heareth us, the idea of that word is, is to consider something. It, it's the idea of considering. For example, I'll give you an illustration. The kids are begging for the candy bars, remember, at the checkout counter. And then I finally say to my child, I don't want to hear any more about it. I will not, I am not going to hear any more about this. Well, that doesn't mean that I can't still physically hear them talk. It just means that I'm not going to consider it. I'm not even going to consider, it's not in my will for you to have that candy bar and I'm not even considering it. That's the idea of here. God always hears our prayers in the sense of, you know, he, he hears every prayer because of the blood of Jesus Christ if we're saved. He hears them physically. But what he's saying is, if we're not praying in accordance with his will, he's not even going to consider that. You say, well, Pastor Dan, uh, what if I, I'm not sure? And what if it's an area that seems to be gray in my mind? And I, you know, and I just, I'm not sure. Then you know what? I don't think you can ever go wrong praying like Jesus did the night before he went to the cross. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but thy will. Number three, prayer moves the Lord to action. That's the third thing I want you to get from this text. Prayer moves the Lord to action. I want you to notice here the correlation. It's so cool. Notice the correlation between our prayers and divine action. Look at verse number 38. 38. Jesus said, pray ye, that's us, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he, that's God, will send forth laborers into his harvest. Did you notice the correlation here? You pray, he says, and God is moved to action and God will send forth. And I looked up that phrase, send forth. And if you look up the phrase send forth, it literally means to eject. 
Anybody ever see, anybody ever go to a circus as a kid and see a human cannonball? You know, and that's the idea. He says, you pray and I'm going to eject workers. I'm going to send forth workers into my harvest field. Isn't it interesting that it's God's harvest. He's the one that needs workers. And yet we're told to pray for it. That lets you know how committed God is to working in response to the prayers of his people. Things that are clearly God's will. He still needs men and women to pray. And that's the story of the Bible. God and man working together. And God is committed to working through humans in regards to his dealings here on earth. That's why Jesus had to become a man. God was so committed to working on the earth through human instrumentality that the incarnation had to happen. God became a man and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ, as a man had to pray if he wanted to see God do something he knew he had to pray prayer is what gets God involved in a situation we see that in the Bible from beginning to end you want to get God involved you got to pray prayer is what gets God involved you say man my marriage is terrible get God involved in your marriage you say how pray you say man I got problems at work well, get God involved in that. How? Pray. Prayer is what gets God involved in a situation. You say, I got problems with some people up there at that church. Pray. Pray. I got problems with that Pastor Dan. Pray. Pray for me. Seriously, how much have you prayed for me? You know? Now I got problems with my kids. Pray. Prayer is what gets God involved in a situation. That principle is from Genesis to Revelation. What do you want to see God do? Pray. Prayer is what gets God involved. Prayer is what gets, moves God to action. You know, uh, I, I love the story where Solomon in the Old Testament is dedicating the temple to God for Israel. And there's this big, long prayer Solomon prays. It's beautiful prayer. And he prays this big, long prayer in 2 Chronicles 6. Then when you get to 2 Chronicles 7, it ends, and, and God basically says this to Solomon. All right, listen. He says to Sol God says to Solomon, he says, Solomon, I have heard your prayer, which is awesome right there in, its, in and of itself. That's just so cool. Every time I read in the Bible how God heard their prayer, I say, ooh, that's so cool. God is listening. God hears. And God said, Solomon, I heard your prayer. And he said, if the day comes that I have to judge Israel, because God knew the way of man. And he, and he said, if I've got to judge Israel because of disobedience, they haven't kept the covenant that I've given them, they've just rebelled against me. He says, if the day comes that I have to judge Israel and not send rain, and I have to basically devour their land and bring them to poverty if and then I want you to look in your handout and let's pick it up what God said here's what God said look at it with me it's in your handout he said Solomon if look at that first word if what's going to turn the situation around for Israel if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and what pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land now mine eyes shall be open and my ears attent unto the prayer that is made in this place what somebody tell me what moves God to action I am so glad many of you answered that. I would hate to preach for 30 minutes and everybody go, I don't know. I don't have a clue. What moves God to action? Say it with me. Prayer. God said, if I got to judge you, you can turn things around. He tells Israel, and again, this is Old Testament. It has to do with the temple and physical land. That's not us today. But the principle's still there. 
And that is, he says, if you want to turn things around here, you're going to have to pray. My people have to, and and poor prayer is humbling, you know, because you're admitting you can't do something when you pray. And so you pray, you seek God's face, he said, and I will respond to that. That is the one thing I will respond to. You get puffed up, you get prideful, you complain, you gripe, you accuse God, this isn't fair. He said, none of that's going to work. But if my people will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, that's what will move me to action. I will hear them, and I will answer their prayer. Aren't you glad? We've got a God that hears and answers prayer. Amen. I want to return to the thought of the text. There's a harvest of hurting and lost people that need somebody to reach out to them. Jesus said, you got to pray. But did you know that is exactly what Paul taught the church? In 1 Timothy chapter 2, he says, God will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God says, I want everyone to be in my family. God says, I want everyone to be saved from their sin. I want everybody to know the truth. God says, I will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. But three verses before that, we have the key to it. And this is what Paul said in verse 1 of that chapter. He said that prayers and supplications should be made for all men. Twice he uses the phrase all men in four verses. He says God wants all men to be saved. But then in verse 1 he says, but prayers need to be made for all men. And I said this at 945, and I'm just going to reiterate it. I don't know that anyone has ever come to know the Lord that didn't have somebody praying for him. I really believe that. You say, well, I know the Lord, I'm saved, and I don't think anybody prayed for me. Really? When you get to heaven, you might find out there were people praying for you you didn't even know about. You see, God answers prayer. God, prayer is what moves the Lord to action. And he says, you want, I want, God says, I want all men to be saved. How will his will be carried through, though? He says, through prayer, you have to pray for all men. And the key is this, the mission is to go, and we are the light of the world. And so the question is, okay, each one reach one, Constance Sung. It's like, who can I be praying for? You say, man, my boss is mean and ornery. Pray for her. Pray for him. You say, man, I tell you what, this person, that person in my family is this and that. Pray for him. Pray. Number four, last thing. Prayer not only moves the Lord to action, gets him involved. Prayer is personal and specific. It's the last thing. Now, I, 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 want, I want to reiterate what the Lord said. All right? Jesus said in verse 38, Pray, therefore, the Lord of the harvest. Is that what the Bible says? It's okay to say no. Some of you don't know, see, because you weren't looking. And that's why I always emphasize, always look into your Bible and check me out. I left out a word, and it's an important word. I said, verse 38 said, pray therefore the Lord of the harvest. And I left out a word. What word did I leave out? Ye. Ye. That word ye is an old English word for you, and it's in the plural form if you look it up. And he is speaking specifically to the 12 disciples here. And he says to them, pray you. And I don't know if he pointed like that. I don't know if he said, pray you, as he looked at them right in the eyeballs. I don't know. But he made it very personal. He could have just said, hey, guys, we need, you know, just pray. He said, no, pray you. He made it very, very personal. That's like if my wife says, we need to clean this house. Everybody just sits around. But if she looks my boys in the eyes and she says to them, clean you the living room. Now she gets action. Clean you your bedroom. Now she gets action. Jesus Christ says, pray you the Lord of the harvest that he'll send forth labors. So he gets, what that tells me is that Jesus made this very personal. 
He wanted for them to pray very specifically that the Lord would send forth laborers into his harvest. I, I tell you what, I just got to tell you, that has been something I have prayed about for years here, almost every day. I pray, Lord, please raise up laborers at Crossroads. Raise up people with a heart for you. Raise up people that want to grow in your word. Raise up people with a servant's heart that want to labor. And you know, as I meet on, uh, we have our staff meeting on Mondays. And I look around this huge conference table and I see people all around the table that are on our staff. And I look at it and I realize every single one of our staff members was homegrown. God raised them up right here at Crossroads. Not one person hired in from the outside. Everyone has been raised up right here in the ministry. Most of them were all church members before they ever became a full-time staff member. And I look at that and I think, wow, God, you have answered our prayers. I look at Walk Through Bethlehem. I look at uh, the, the dinner crew on Wednesday. I look all over and I look and I think, wow, God's answering prayer. God's raising up people with a heart to serve here. God's raising on. And I, again, I look at our staff. I see, man, all the way from the pastors down to the guys who are in high school working 10 hours a week of maintenance. Everyone is homegrown. Everybody is right here from Crossroads. Thank you, Lord, for that. You see, God wanted them to pray specifically. Obviously, Jesus believed that God answers prayer. And I think one of the reasons why we don't pray more specifically is we really don't think God answers prayer. Therefore, we pray in very generic, very broad generalities. Oh, Lord, bless everybody. Okay. It's a little broad, don't you think? What do you want God to do? Pray specifically and personally about it. There's a verse in your in your handout. I want you to look at it, Colossians 4.12, and I'm almost done. If we believe in prayer, we should pray fervently, passionately, and specifically. Look at this. Here's an example of a guy who did. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring, there's that word again, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. What do you want to see? Listen, I'm telling you, what do you want to see God do in your life? What do you want to see God do in your children's lives? What do you want to see God do at your church? What do you want to see God do in your personal life? What do you want to see? Pray specifically. Pray in a very personal, very specific way. God is hearing you. Prayer is the solution to our problems. Prayer is, it moves the Lord to action. Prayer is very personal. It's very specific. And I know it's one of those things that you don't see maybe an immediate result. You don't, you don't pray and look out your window in, in, in the front yard and see the result, right? Like I thought as a kid. I know it doesn't always work that way. But I'm telling you, there's incredible power in prayer. And I'm telling you, 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 you really need to be praying about whatever's on your heart today. Whoever you know that needs Christ, you may be the only one to pray for them. I believe there are people who are born and who die. And never one time in their life does anyone ever pray for them. I believe that happens. Definitely. Definitely. People that are in other countries and they don't have access to the gospel, they, you know, and so forth, they, 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 they born, they die, and not one time did anybody ever call their name out to God in prayer. Pray. Pray. What's the key to getting additional laborers to serve in God's harvest fields? Jesus said pray. Now, it'd be quite hypocritical to pray for additional labors if we aren't serving the Lord ourselves. Lord, I pray you'll send forth labors into your harvest fields. Well, are you going? No, but I sure hope all those other slouches get with it. <laughs> it's a little hypocritical, don't you think? So my question today, in conclusion, is twofold. Number one, will you labor for Jesus Christ? Will you be among the Lord's few? And I'm not just talking about something on Sunday. I'm talking about what these, 
things behind me say? Are you going to let your light shine during the week? Will you, will you go? Will you be that, that witness for Christ? Will you be a laborer in his harvest fields to help hurting people? And then number two, it says in your handout, will you pray for co-laborers? Will you pray for other people to labor? Souls are in need, souls are at stake. We need to be people of prayer.